the people have spoken, and they want an isopod video. So now here I am trying to cram this group into a 10 minute script. A group with detritivores and predators and parasites, with terrestrial and aquatic groups, with individuals of a few millimeters to over a foot, and plenty of unique species worth covering. So bear with me here while I take my best crack at it. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the order Isopoda, better known as the isopods. These critters were believed to have originated in the Carboniferous period over 300 million years ago. Now they can be found worldwide, from deserts to Antarctic oceans. Isopods are not insects, as you might have guessed, but more surprisingly, they're not myriapods either. This is a pill millipede. It's a myriapod. This is an isopod. It's a crustacean. These are two completely different groups. Isopods are actually more closely related to the insects than they are these pill millipedes. But overall, isopods come in many shapes and sizes, with over 10,000 described species. So let's talk about some traits you can rely on to figure out if you're looking at one. Isopods are crustaceans, and though crustaceans are incredibly diverse in form, they all have two pairs of antennae. So this can help separate out the isopods from other groups of arthropoda. But be careful though, because in some of these groups, the second pair of antennae are heavily reduced and barely visible. Unlike other crustaceans, isopods have seven pairs of legs. So if you can count the legs, that's one of the best ways to lock in an ID. There is one group, the Nathiidae, that only has five pairs of walking legs. Weird looking dude. I think we honestly need to just do a quick jargon-filled anatomy lesson to really get a handle on isopod morphology. I apologize in advance. This is an isopod. You can separate out their body into three broad sections in two different ways. The first is head, thorax, abdomen. The problem is, the first segment of the thorax is fused to the head, which can be a little confusing. So a lot of people will separate it out into three functional groups. So the cephalon is the head and the first segment of the thorax, the perion is the remaining thoracic segments, and the pleon is the abdomen. The appendages on the perion are called periopods, and those are what we would call the legs. The appendages on the pleon are pleopods, and those are normally used for respiration or swimming. So isopods have seven pairs of periopods and six pairs of pleopods, with the sixth pair being the uropods, located at the back of the pleon. As you can see, legs are pretty important to isopod anatomy, and the name isopod actually translates to equal-footed, iso equal pod foot, and this refers to how their seven pairs of periopods are roughly the same size and shape. Okay, time for the stuff most of y'all came for. Let's dive into their life cycle and ecology. Isopod life cycles can vary, especially when we get into the parasitic ones, because that's never simple. Many isopods are going to undergo direct development, going from egg to juvenile to adult, where the juveniles look like smaller versions of the adult. But in the parasitic isopods, you'll find indirect development, where there are distinct larval forms that look completely different from the adult and may even have different hosts. But even for those that have direct development, there are some complications. So isopods do lay eggs, but not in the way you'd expect. Female isopods have a pouch on their underside called a marsupium, and they will lay eggs into this marsupium and keep them there so they stay safe and moist. Even in terrestrial isopods, moisture is critical, and many isopods can actually uptake water through their rectum to aid in water absorption. After a month or so, the eggs hatch into what look like tiny isopods, but there's a catch. These little guys only have six pairs of legs. We call them mancae. Once they molt and get their seventh pair of periopods, then we just call them juveniles. The juveniles feed on the same sorts of things that the adults feed on. 
growing in size, and eventually reaching sexual maturity over the course of a few months. So what do isopods eat? Well, this is a loaded question, but some are detritivores, feeding on leaf litter and rotting wood. Others graze on algae or biofilms. You've got scavengers, like the giant isopod, feeding on dead carcasses. And then, of course, the parasites. Parasitic isopods can be found in both freshwater and saltwater. Some will feed on fish, but many specialize on other crustaceans, like crayfish or shrimp. You may remember those videos by Jacob Colvin where he'd remove parasitic isopods from mud shrimp. This is a good thing, don't worry. They're invasive where he's from. Though perhaps the most famous parasitic isopod is the tongue-eating louse, Cymothoa exigua. These isopods enter through the gills of fish. Now, the males will stay in that general area, but the female latches onto the host's tongue. It will sever the blood vessels, causing atrophy and leaving behind a stub. By latching onto this stub, the female takes up the mantle of fish tongue. It feeds on various bodily fluids, and oddly enough, actually still helps to manipulate the fish's food just as its old tongue used to. And this doesn't seem to be a source of serious damage for the fish, though it may be a little underweight. Once isopods have reached maturity, they need to find a mate. For some, this isn't too difficult. Many isopods are gregarious anyway, using aggregation pheromones to locate one another and group up for protection against dehydration, against predators, locate sources of food, and more. Pheromones as a whole play an important role in isopod reproduction. Even aquatic isopods can be found releasing waterborne pheromones to locate a mate. And one species of isopod, Hemilepistis reomuri, is monogamous and uses unique chemical cues to identify its mate and kin. Isopods mate directly, with the male linking up to the female and passing along a spermatophore, a package of sperm, which the female uptakes and can store for later use. Though there are some species that seem to fertilize eggs after they're laid in the marsupium. And as a failsafe, some species can actually change their sex and others can reproduce asexually through parthenogenesis. Regardless of how they go about it, the cycle continues. Things don't always go according to plan though. Sometimes you get nabbed by a predator before you have a chance to pass along your genes. Isopods have a couple different methods to avoid this fate. Perhaps the most well-known strategy is curling up into a ball to protect their vulnerable underside. You see a lot of terrestrial isopods do this, and it has given them the nickname roly polies. But there is a fancy term for this. We call it conglobation, the act of curling into a ball. Another physical defense in the isopods is the presence of spines. If they are going down, they're not going down smoothly. Some isopods can also secrete noxious chemicals when disturbed, often displaying aposomatic coloration as a warning to predators of their foul taste. There are also behavioral defenses, such as running, jumping, staying very still, or grouping up together for safety in numbers. And it's a good thing they're able to stick around, as these little critters are critical for keeping our environments clean and our nutrients cycling. Cleaning up all sorts of detritus, such as leaf litter, rotting wood, or old carcasses. They also make great pets, with a thriving community of hobbyists passionate about keeping and observing captive isopod populations. But it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. There are still the parasitic isopods. Now, under normal circumstances, these are essential and healthy parts of a functioning ecosystem. But in our fisheries, large outbreaks of parasitic isopods can affect fish growth and reproduction. And don't forget about invasive species, like that parasite of mud shrimp we talked about earlier, making its way from Asia and Russia to the Pacific coast of North America. But overall, we like isopods. They do a lot for the habitats around us, whether we realize it or not. And there are some steps you can take to keep your local isopods happy and healthy. The main thing is detritus. Coarse woody debris and leaf litter can provide the essential food and habitat needed to combat habitat loss and sustain strong populations. But there is another potential threat to isopod populations that's a little more obscure. So, part of what makes invertebrate protection tricky is that population data can be cryptic and difficult to collect accurately. 
Also, not as many people are tracking their populations in the first place. As the isopod pet trade continues to increase, there are worries that some of these more rare and charismatic species are being overcollected. So if you are purchasing isopods, do some research into who you're buying from and make sure they have any and all permits in order, as well as gathering info on where the specimens originated. Keep in mind that different countries have different regulations. Also, don't go releasing anything you purchased outside. Even if that species does occur in your region, you can mess up the genetics of the local population. But overall, I'm glad these guys are getting more love and recognition in recent years. They definitely deserve it. But anyways, thank you all so much for listening. And if you have any favorite species from this group, and I know some of you do, please leave them in the comments below. Also, if you have any personal anecdotes or just any fun facts I missed, please let me know as well. I always love hearing about them. Peace, y'all.